I'm going to do a little review okay, of the anatomy and physiology of the heart, make sure everybody's comfortable with that, and then we'll start working our way into the cardiac conduction system. Okay? So everybody knows the basic stuff that the heart is a large muscle in our chest. Right? It's basically a two-sided pump. One side is pumping to our lungs, one side is pumping to our body. Okay? We have different chambers, the upper chambers are the atriums, the lower chambers are the ventricles. Obviously the atriums are very thin walled chambers because they only have to pump right, a couple inches down to the ventricles and the ventricles being the thicker chambers. Both sides of the heart, the right and left side of the heart, are divided by a septal wall. Okay? It's actually one of the worst places to have a heart attack. Remember, the heart attack you could have in any wall of your heart. The septal wall is the wall inside your heart that divides the right and left side. If you get a heart attack in there, anytime you have a heart attack and you survive, that whole area that was damaged is scar tissue. And one of the things that could happen um, is that the scar could rupture. So you're, you know, you're two years past your MI, everything's wonderful, and you decide to, I don't know, go jogging. And I, if anybody's had a heart attack and you're jogging, God bless you, and I'm not saying this is going to happen to you, but anyway, you increase your pressure in your heart, and what happens? That area where the scar tissue is, where the infarct was, it blows, it blows loose. Okay, what happens to you? You die. Right? It's, it's, it's a septal wall infarct, okay? And it just blows loose, and now blood is going back and forth ac across the heart instead of in the right direction. So that's the septal wall. And the reason we bring it up is that most of our conduction system, okay, is going to run through the septal wall or at some point. Okay. Okay. I didn't know it was going to do that. Okay. Okay. So anyway, the mediastinum is an area in the center of our chest where all our important stuff is. And you know this term from what traumatic injury do we always talk about the mediastinum? What traumatic injury? A tension pneumothorax. What happens when you have a tension pneumothorax? Okay. You have this pressure that's exerting on your mediastinum, right? It's causing this shift. And what starts moving over? What's, what, kills, what kills somebody in a tension pneumothorax? What kills somebody? Attention pneumothorax. Okay, they can't breathe. Is that actually what kills them? No. What kills them? It's a form of obstructive shock, which means that it's interfering with blood flow. Does anybody have any idea what, what blood vessels it's interfering with? Okay, the low pressure, the veins that are bringing blood back to the heart, the inferior subpoena vena cava, when it presses over, it doesn't let blood get back to the heart. And obviously, if blood doesn't come into the right side of the heart, blood is not going out. Okay, so that whole area of the mediastinum is basically where we're talking about tonight with the heart. Okay, so it would be the structure right in here. So you see everything pretty much fits in perfectly. Okay, there's not a lot of different room. Your right lung has three lobes. Your left lung only has two lobes with a little notch okay, where the heart fits in. And your heart has various different linings. So you've all heard of the pericardium, right? Peri means around. So pericardium is the sac around the heart. And all all organs have a lining on them. So if you ever turned over like spare ribs, the, inside of the, the underside of the spare ribs has that very smooth lining, okay? And your lungs would also have that very smooth lining. And in between those two smooth linings is a tiny little bit of fluid that acts as oil. So when you're breathing in and out, the lungs can slide across your ribs and you won't have any pain. And you've heard of pleurisy, okay? Well, the same thing could happen with the heart. The heart okay, has a smooth lining on it, and the inside of the pericardial sac has a smooth lining on it. And in between it, there's a tiny little bit of serous fluid, a little bit of oil, a little bit of lubrication. And sometimes we have emergencies where fluid starts to build up in that sac. And what's the danger, do you think, if fluid builds up in the sac? Good. So you learned in EMT class one traumatic emergency that I've never seen. We always hear about, but we've never seen. What traumatic emergency could be where there's bleeding inside the pericardial sac? pericardial tamponade or cardiac tamponade. So that's pretty rare, okay? I mean, it doesn't happen all too often. But we do have, okay, people have what's called a pericardial effusion. So they have pericarditis, they have an infection, okay, inside the sac of the heart, and they get a pericardial effusion. They get the infectious fluid building up inside the sac, and it starts to interfere with the ability for the heart to expand. And then obviously if the heart can't expand, the chambers can't fill, and what happens? What gets decreased if your chambers of your heart can't <coughs> Phil, what happens? Your cardiac output, your stroke volume, the amount of blood the heart is going to pump out decreases. Now you've all probably, anybody who's been doing it along, you probably treated somebody with pericarditis and you thought they were having a heart attack because they appear like they're having a heart attack. They have chest pain, they're cool, pale, and diaphoretic, they're short of breath, look very sick, you know, it looks like a real classic MI. Does anybody know how we might be able to tell the difference on our assessment, on our history and our assessment?
if it's pericarditis versus, now you're always going to treat them as an MI because you always treat the worst, right? So I'm not saying you may not assume they're having an MI until they prove it otherwise in the hospital, but does anybody have any idea how you would differentiate? Blood pressure. Yeah. Okay. That's real late. Okay, so you have a narrowing of the pulse pressure. Very good. That's a very late sign. So I don't think they'd even be talking to you at that point if they got that sick. But early on. So if you had an infectious etiology going on, what's... The febrile? Very good. I'm sorry. <laughs> I tried the wolf down a pastrami sandwich. Anyway, uh, yes, they would be febrile. Absolutely. So, and how long do you think they're going to tell you they've been sick and feeling not great for? A while. a while, right? It's not going to be the guy who says, I woke up this morning and I have chest discomfort and I don't feel well. This takes days to develop. So they're typically sick for a while, okay? They have a fever, okay? Now what's interesting is a lot of times when they get sicker, they're not going to feel warm from the fever. They're actually going to get a cold because they're getting shocky, okay? So it could be a period the way. They could actually be warm or they could be cold, okay? Anything else we could think of? So if you had this infection in your chest, that's causing the chest pain, right? That's where it's not the lactic acid of a heart attack that's causing the chest pain in this situation. It's the, it's the, the infection that's causing the pain. So one of the things that would be, one of the good positive findings that you would have is if they tell you the pain changes with movement, especially what? Does anybody have any idea? Leaning forward, sitting forward or leaning forward. They let the sack shift a little bit. Now they have no idea. All they know is that they, over the last two or three days they've been trying to get comfortable and this position leaning forward. So you may find them at the, you know, leaning over the table that way. So if you have that kind of story and they have a fever, they've been sick for a couple days, it could be a pericarditis. So what I would do in that situation is call medical control and say to them, you know, do you still want me to give the aspirin? Do you still want me to, you know, treat them as an MI, give them the nitro if they have it, take it at home? And you can see what they want to do. They may pick up on what you're telling them and say, no, it sounds like a pericarditis. Bring them in. They're going to do an echocardiogram real quick by the bedside. And they'll see the fluid in the sac. And they'll know that it's not an MI. Most of the times, those people still wind up going up to the cath lab just to be on the safe side. But, you know, it's probably more of an infectious origin. Okay, and then the heart itself has some linings. So the epicardium is the outside of the heart. That's that smooth lining I was going to say that touches the, you know, where the fluid touches between the two, the pericardium and the outside of the heart. The myocardium we know, right? That's the thick muscular pumping part, okay? That's where a lot of the um, things we're going to talk about tonight are there, okay? And then the endocardium is the inside of the heart, okay, uh, where the blood would actually be touching. So there's a different layers of the heart, okay? Um, We'll do it when we do the blood vessels. Now the heart has a, a set of valves or sets of valves that help direct blood in only one way. So we have AV valves, okay, which stands between the atrium and the ventricle. So they obviously are between the right atrium and right ventricle and left atrium and left ventricle. And the semilunar valves are between the ventricles and the blood vessels they pump into. So on the right side, this would be called the pulmonic valve and it's between the right ventricle and the pulmonary artery. And on the left side, this would be between the left ventricle and the aorta, so it would be called the aortic valve. And one of the interesting things now is, you know, having a valve replaced used to be major surgery. What's one of the things they're capable of doing now? Floating it up. So they have this Tavar system where they actually go in through your femoral vein, I'm sorry, femoral artery probably, and snake it all the way up, okay? And they can take out the old one, okay, and, and put in a new one without actually cutting into your chest unless you have a complication. Yeah, I mean, it's, it, it actually allows, there was, uh, last night I was at an uh, ambulance corps dinner and somebody's 90 year old um, mother was basically in a, uh, in a wheelchair, couldn't move around because she had a, a aortic valve stenosis and she wasn't pumping blood out, it was backing all up, she was always going into failure and they basically said, you know, there's nothing we could do, she's too old for surgery, they went to a different hospital and uh, where they do this and they said well she's really a little too old for us to try it and the whole family started crying the patient started crying and they basically guilted the guy the doctor into trying it and he said okay here's the deal either you are gonna make you wonderfully better or you're gonna die on the table so if you're happy with that and she's like I can't live the way I am I'll take the chance and you know now she's basically going out again and you know she's fully functioning no more wheelchair no more oxygen so you know who would have thought at 90 years of age you know that they would do this Okay, so what's the purpose of the valve? So obviously the purpose of valves is only to allow fluid to go in one direction, okay? We actually have valves in our veins, 
right? Because the problem with veins is they're low pressure vessels, and if we didn't have these valves, while I'm standing up, my blood would actually be going backwards. So the valves allow the blood only to go in one direction towards my heart, and we'll talk about that in a second. So the AV valves on the right side is called your tricuspid valve. On the left side is called your bicuspid valve. It just means how many flaps, how many leaflets they have on them. And you probably know more from the left side, the mitral valve, right? You've all heard of mitral valve prolapse or mitral valve stenosis, where the mitral valve is not working well. What patient would be at risk for mitral valve problems? What history would they tell you that they may have had as a child that might put them at risk for mitral valve problems? What's that? Well, that's what you might hear, rheumatic fever. Who said it, right? Rheumatic fever. So for some reason, there's a correlation to children who had rheumatic fever as a child and later having valvular problems. So the mitral valve would be one of those problems. So if the mitral valve is between your left atrium, okay, and left ventricle, what's it supposed to do? If you want to pump blood out of your left ventricle into your aorta, what has to happen? The, 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 the mitral valve has to do what? Open or close. If you want blood, it has to close, and the aortic valve is going to do what? Open. So if you have now mitral valve stenosis where it doesn't close completely, and the ventricle pumps, now what happens? Besides some blood going in the right direction and going out into the aorta, what's going to happen? Some blood is going to regurgitate, and somebody said a murmur, and so you hear sounds, you hear very distinctive sounds when that happens. Okay, but now what starts to happen to the patient? So if you're not pumping as much blood as you thought into the aorta, what has to happen? Your blood pressure should go which way? <coughs> Down. But now you've also got f blood backing up, okay, into your left atrium, and eventually it backs up from the left atrium into what? The lungs. And what do they go into? pulmonary edema, right? So this is one of the things when you have very serious mitral valve stenosis, they're going to go into car car congestive heart failure into, into acute pulmonary edema because the blood is not going into the right direction. And obviously there's nothing really anybody could do but somebody who's going to replace the valve. Short term, you can try to relieve a little bit of the pressure or relieve a little bit of the fluid of the body so they don't flash over and they don't back up as much, but it's, it's a surgical fix. Okay, and then the semilunar valves, we said, are between the ventricles and the blood vessels they pump into. So on the right side, you have the pulmonic valve, which is the valve that controls blood going from the right ventricle into the pulmonary artery, okay? And you have the aortic valve on the left side, which is preventing, um, not preventing, but allowing blood to go from the left ventricle into the aorta. Now, a couple interesting things. So we've all heard of a pulmonary embolism, right? What's a pulmonary embolism? Blood or fat clot for air. Okay, so it's a, it, is, it is a clot, okay, or an emboli or something that lodges where? So everybody says the lungs. Does it actually have anything to do with the lungs? It sounds pulmonary, it sounds like it does, but does it have anything to do with airflow? No. Absolutely not. It has to do with blood flow. So it's a clot that lodges, hopefully not in your main pulmonary artery. So picture, <coughs> you, have your, you have your right ventricle that comes into a blood vessel called the pulmonary artery, pumps into it, right? That pulmonary artery has to do what? Has to split because you have a right and left lung, right? So where it splits, okay, is called the saddle. Think of your legs on the horse as the saddle. If the clot hits the saddle and lodges there, what happens to you? Dead. Nothing. Hopefully it's going to, hopefully you're not going to have one, but if it happens, hopefully it's going to now travel down, okay, one of the two pulmonary branches of the pulmonary artery and go lower and lower down, and it's going to obstruct blood flow, but in a tiny portion of your pulmonary circulation. So really whether you live or die from a pulmonary embolism depends on how large the clot was and how large of a vessel it occluded. So what puts our patients at risk for having a pulmonary embolism? AFib, good. So what's atrial fibrillation? That's when those upper chambers of the heart, instead of contracting, do what? Quiver. So we know VFib, and everybody's dead if they're in VFib. Why do people live in AFib? Why are they walking around talking if they're in AFib? Okay, so most of the blood, very good. Most of the blood goes from the atrium to the ventricles, okay, not by pumping, but by gravity, okay? So about 75% of your blood actually goes by gravity, and 25% goes by the atriums contracting. So when you're in AFib, you're only losing 25% of blood flow from the atriums to the ventricles. Not ideal, but not death, okay? Now, one of the dangers is if you're not completely emptying your atrium and blood is sticking, uh, sitting up there, what happens to it? It clots. If you're not on anticoagulants, it clots, right? And we know the danger of anticoagulants is if there's not enough, you develop clots. And if there's too much, what happens? You bleed. 
So it's not a, an exact science, although there's a lot of new medications out there, okay, pills, that are much safer to use and much easier to reverse if the patient has a problem. So that actually would be a good CME to start going over all these new medications that people are on, you know, that we really don't even hear too much about. The patients know probably more about it, you know, than we do. So AFib is definitely one. And what's interesting about AFib is if the clot is in the right atrium, right, it breaks loose, it's going to go into the right ventricle, then it's going to go into the pulmonary circulation, you probably have a pulmonary embolism. If it lodges, it breaks free from the left atrium and goes left ventricle into the aorta, what are you going to have? Can't have a pulmonary embolism because it's past the lungs already, so what are you going to have? It's going to go up into the aorta, the aorta arches, and you've got these blood vessels that go up to your brain, you're going to have a stroke. Right? So that's why it's very important, you know, when patients are in atrial fibrillation that they get to the hospital and they get treated because there's, you know, it's, there's a lot of things that could go wrong with it. What else puts people at risk for a pulmonary embolism? Okay, deep vein thrombosis. So what puts people at risk to get a deep vein thrombosis? Inactivity, fractures, right, not moving around, okay. What are some rare causes of a pulmonary embolism? So there's two rare ones. One is, what's that? What? Pape and haste. Pulmonary embolism? From, from the high altitude? Yeah, no, that's, no? you want to get pulmonary embolism. High, high altitude sickness, I mean, Ed could speak to this, but uh, high altitude sickness, right, you can get something called high altitude pulmonary edema and high altitude cerebral edema. We land lovers, there's no place in New York State where you're going to get those two things. Um, so you don't have to worry about that. Even Mount Washington is not high enough. Um, you'll die there of exposure, environmental exposure to cold before you'll die of those. But, uh, you know, you can go out west, being a, you know, flatlander, as they would call us. You can go out west and definitely, like, you can go to Denver or any cities that are higher and get winded. But the worst manifestation is that you would go into what they call high altitude pulmonary edema. Because of the pressure, you'd actually go into pulmonary edema, or you'd have all the signs and symptoms of a stroke, but it's called high altitude cerebral edema. So, but, you know, we're not gonna probably see that over here unless you're, you know, traveling to other places and stuff like that. But the rare ones would be a long bone fracture. So you have a patient who broke a bone, you're splinting him, taking care of him, and all of a sudden they say, my chest, my chest, I can't breathe. And what probably happened is it was a compound fracture, okay, and the bones probably tore a little bit of tissue or fat or a blood clot and it got sucked up into a vein that was cut, okay. Obviously you can't get sucked up into an artery because the artery's pumping out, okay. So again, that's pretty catastrophic. And then the rarest of them is an amniotic fluid emboli. So obviously, when is that going to happen? So a woman is giving birth, the baby comes out, it's only one baby, right? And what has to come out next? The placenta. So the placenta we know grows hundreds of blood vessels between the wall of the placenta and the uterus, and then when it's not needed anymore, it sheds. So all those blood vessels start to bleed as it pulls loose, which is the blood we see, you know, when we deliver a baby, but hopefully the placenta is going to contract and put pressure by pushing on it, but sometimes, very rarely, I mean the rarest of all, a little something could get sucked up into those veins, whether it be amniotic fluid or a little blood clot. So this would be a mother who delivered the baby, and you're getting ready to go, okay, and all of a sudden she says, you know, my chest, my chest, and I can't breathe. So it's, it's rare but catastrophic. Okay, so what causes the heart valves to open and close is the pressure in the chests, and we're, we know we know what systole and diastole is, right? So systole is when the heart does what? contracts and pushes out, okay, that's obviously our higher blood pressure, and diastole is when the, the chambers of the heart are filling up, okay. Um, so, you know, what's going to happen uh, during systole or when the valves are going to open, okay, actually depends on which valves we're talking about, but the AV valves would be closed, the, the semilunar valves between the ventricles and the blood vessels would be open, blood would be able to leave the ventricles and go out into the blood vessels, and then the opposite, okay, when it's refilling. So the valves have to work in conjunction with the heart pumping for everything to go in the right way. And then we have the containers that the blood goes through. We have arteries, veins, and capillaries, okay? So we know pretty much that arteries are our thick vessels bringing blood away from the heart. Veins are our thinner walled vessels bringing blood back to the heart. And then capillaries are the most important part of all our blood vessels. So because only at the capillary level can what occur? <laughs> Perfusion, right? Perfusion is the feeding of the cells. If we don't feed the cells, we die, right? The cells die, we die. So, you know, the capillaries could actually make fun of everybody else. They could say the only role of an artery is to bring blood to me, right? And the only role of a vein is to bring blood back, my used up blood back. So everything that's important happens at a capillary level, okay? So arteries obviously are very thick wall. They're muscular. They can constrict and dilate, 
Okay, and again, they have layers pretty much just like the heart does. Okay, and one of the things that we talked about in one of the previous classes is that sometimes when people have heart attacks, okay, we said that the, the new theory of heart attacks is not a clot lodging in the pulmonary circulation, is that what happened inside that artery? Based on the fact that Ernie served us, the food he served us tonight, we developed what? <laughs> Fat plaque, okay, in the inside of our, uh, you know, I always thought it's great when we talk about, you know, EMS and health and stuff and the, the garbage we eat, but I did have two, well, one and a half pastrami sandwiches, so. <laughs> But anyway, in the, the tuna, tunica imita right here, in the innermost layer, we get this fat deposit, right? And the body knows it doesn't belong there, so what does it grow over it? A cap. Yeah, a hard cap, right? Kind of like an M&M. &M. You got the hard shell and the stuff inside. And sometimes that cap ruptures, okay? And now the body thinks what occurred inside the artery? A wound. And what does it send there? Platelets. Okay, does it immediately seal off that artery? No, it takes hours, which is why most people having heart attacks tell us what? My, my chest pain has been going on for two hours, you know, three hours or something like that. Now obviously it depends on how narrow the artery is and how fast those platelets go, how fast it's gonna close off. But the guy who grabs his chest and drops to the floor and dies, probably is not the typical heart attack. It's probably more of a, a saddle embolism from a pulmonary embolism, or this is the unlucky guy who has the heart attack we believed for years, which was the clot traveling through and it lodged somewhere, just shut off blood flow, okay? So this is the, the culprit of most heart attacks, that area in there. Okay, so veins, we have, well, actually one thing with the arteries. So we have regular large arteries and then we have smaller arteries, arterioles, and then we'd have capillaries. And then we'd have something called venules, which are over here. So venules are small veins, and then the small veins would bring it back to large <coughs> veins, okay? So that's the circulation. You got big vein, aorta, big veins, okay? Smaller veins, arterioles, I'm sorry, aorta, thank you, I'm a little tired. Aorta, okay, big, big arteries, smaller arteries, okay, arterioles, capillaries, or capillary beds, okay? Small veins, venules, back to big veins, back to the right atrium, okay? So that's basically how the circulation would work. Now, obviously the pressure in the veins is very, very, very low. So how does the, you know, there's no more pumping, there's no more pushing at that point, right? It's traveled all the way through your capillaries, which are tiny little blood vessels, so there's no more real pressure. So how does the blood actually make it back to the heart? Muscles, muscles. who said it? Muscles, you're, when you move your muscles, that's why people who don't walk around, develop blood clots, okay? So muscles move it back up. Your skeletal muscles in your arms and your legs, when you're flexing them is what moves it up. And then we have a series of valves every couple of inches, so you're actually only moving blood in spurts back in your veins and little spurts backwards, upwards towards your heart, okay? So sitting around and not moving doesn't mean your, means your muscles do not contract, which means you do not move blood, okay? Now, you can make it more difficult to move blood if you have something obstructing the blood getting from your legs up to your heart. So what would make it more difficult to get blood back up? Well, standing upright, right, gravity. What else? A woman who's pregnant, right? Do you ever see varicose veins? Did you ever, anybody ever see varicose veins, right? So what is that? That's overly distended veins. So what's gonna cause overly distended veins? Being on your legs too much because the blood can't get back up so the veins distend. Pregnancy, the weight of the baby interferes with it being overweight, okay? And some people just genetically have, are predisposed to it. So those are all different issues and stuff. Okay, then we talked about the capillaries, okay? And this is where all perfusion takes place. The capillaries are so small, you've heard the term microsurgery. Okay, so people, you would actually see, need to have magnifying glasses or microscopic glasses on to be able to see capillaries. They're microscopic, they're so small that blood vessels go through one at a time. So in a line, go through the capillaries. So very, very tiny, okay? Now, we have two-sided circulation we talked about already. So the right side, we said pumps to the lungs. That's your pulmonary circulation. And then you have systemic circulation where the left side pumps to the